tonight. Dubai drowns. An year's worth of rain pours onto the sands of Dubai, causing flash floods, crippling air travel and inundating infrastructures. G7 convenes. Italy sees global leaders file in to discuss the future of conflicts across the globe, with not much progress being seen on any front. Jury duty. Trump's trial enters day two with the selection of jury members coming to pass. Manhattan's district attorney also setting up its targets on Trump. And casual heroics. Everyday valor takes the cake with one man's quick thinking. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Vedana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You're watching World News. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us tonight. We have a number of key stories to get you updates on, starting over in Dubai, where floods continue to inundate the region. Now, a year's worth of rain unleashed immense flash flooding in Dubai as roads turned into rivers and rushing water inundated homes and businesses. Shocking videos showed the tarmac of Dubai International Airport, recently crowned the second busiest airport in the world, underwater as massive aircraft attempt to navigate floodwaters. Large jets looked more like boats moving through the flooded airport as water sprayed in their wake and waves rippled through the deep water. Disruption to airport operations continued with access roads blocked by flooding and multiple airlines including flag carrier Emirates reporting flight delays. Emirates is suspending check-in for passengers departing Dubai due to operational challenges caused by bad weather and road conditions. Dubai International Airport also advised people to not come to the airport unless absolutely necessary and said flights continue to be delayed and diverted. And in Asia now, we continue our reports on the Indian elections. The world's biggest election kicks off in India this month, with nearly a billion people eligible to vote. Opinion polls predict an easy win for Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his Bharatiya Janata Party, or BJP. Still, though, critics point to concerns ranging from uneven economic growth and treatment of India's minority Muslim community to lopsided corruption investigations. Here's what you need to know about the vote that begins on April 19th. India's economy is expected to have grown by about 8% in the last fiscal year. That's the fastest among major countries. And over the past decade, India's economic position has jumped up to fifth in the world. Modi has vowed to bump it up to third if he wins the election. But some say the fruits of that booming economy are more visible in major cities than the vast countryside. Inflation is on the rise, and Modi has largely failed to deliver on a promise to create tens of millions of jobs for young people. The BJP had also promised to double farm income by 2022. There's no sign of that happening yet. The BJP has tried to court women voters with cash handouts, piped water, and 24-7 electricity. And since the global health crisis, the government has been handing out free food rations to nearly 60% of India's 1.4 billion population. Some critics say the fact that the government feels the need to do that is a sign of uneven economic growth. According to the World Inequality Lab, by the end of last year, India's richest citizens owned 40% of its wealth. Modi's regular visits to Hindu temples across the country are broadcast widely on news channels. Political analysts say that bolsters his image of being the champion of India's majority community, which also forms the core base for the Hindu nationalist BJP. Many Muslims say government policies are not good for them. Modi's government has ended federal support for Muslim schools. He's also implemented a citizenship law that has been criticized as discriminating against Muslims. A government agency that investigates suspected money laundering has summoned, questioned, raided, or arrested nearly 150 opposition politicians in the past decade. It's investigated about half a dozen ruling party politicians in the same time period. Modi touts a zero-tolerance policy on corruption, but opposition politicians say he's misusing government agencies to target them. 
As for the vote itself, elections for 543 seats in the lower house of parliament will be held in seven phases between April 19th and June 1st, with votes counted on June 4th. And now the gathering on the Italian island of Capri. The G7 foreign ministers will present a united front in demanding a ceasefire in Gaza, a de-escalation of tensions between Israel and Iran, and will also reiterate full backing for Ukraine in its war against Russia. The island of Capri is beefing up security measures on Tuesday ahead of the G7 foreign ministers' meeting. Host Italy's top diplomat Antonio Tajani said on Monday that efforts to end wars in the Middle East and Ukraine will dominate the meeting. The ministers from major Western powers will present a united front in demanding a ceasefire in Gaza and a de-escalation of tensions between Israel and Iran. On Tuesday, Israel's war cabinet was set to meet for the third time in three days, according to an official. It will decide on a response to Iran's first ever direct attack. Iran launched the attack on Saturday in retaliation for an airstrike on its embassy compound in Damascus on April 1st, attributed to Israel. President Joe Biden told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on the weekend that the United States, Israel's main protector, would not participate in an Israeli counterstrike. Together with European allies, Washington strove to toughen economic and political sanctions in an attempt to persuade Israel to abstain from violent retaliation. This highlights a unified position from the West may not bring peace to the Middle East. Tayani also said the West alone could not bring sufficient pressure on Russia to end the Ukraine war. He said it was essential to involve China. In Ukraine, the momentum on the battlefield has shifted in Russia's favor. The West is seemingly incapable of providing Kiev with the weaponry it desperately needs. The United States has proposed that the G7 looks at ways of utilizing some $300 billion of sovereign Russian assets held in the West to help Kiev. Diplomatic sources say the US, Canada and Britain want the assets to be seized, but EU nations are reluctant to do so because it would set a dangerous legal precedent. Meanwhile, ironic requests came in from the West recently. The U.S. ambassador to the United Nations urged Russia and China to stop shielding North Korea from sanctions evading activities over its weapons program. For more on this, we have other than the world news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli, what's the latest? Yes, Anuradi. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield made the remarks during a visit to the demilitarized zone, a heavily fortified border between the two Koreas, which remain technically at war. Her trip to South Korea came after Russia rejected the annual renewal of the multinational panel of experts that has, over the past 15 years, monitored the implementation on UN sanctions aimed at curbing North Korea's nuclear and missile programs. She claimed Moscow and Beijing are using their positions in the Security Council to shield North Korea from accountability. The envoy also said Washington has always urged Pyongyang to reject provocation and embrace dialogue. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much for the continued updates. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. We're going in for a short commercial break now. We'll be right back with more key global updates. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We continue with updates on Israel's military front now. Lebanese security sources said Israeli strikes in southern Lebanon killed three people, including a Hezbollah field commander, an uptick in violence after at least a week of relative calm in more than half a year of hostilities. Gathering around the mangled car, people in the small village of Ain Bal assess the aftermath of an Israeli drone strike. The attack killed Ismail Youssef Baz, Hezbollah's commander for the Lebanese coastal sector, and injured two others. The Israeli army released this footage, which it says shows the hit on the car carrying Baz. 
Ismail was involved in the promotion and planning of rocket and anti-tank missile launches towards Israel from the coastal area of Lebanon. During the war, he organised and planned a number of terrorist attacks against Israel. Meanwhile, about 10 kilometres away in Shehabiya, separate Israeli strikes on two cars killed at least two Hezbollah members, according to a civil defence official. Earlier Tuesday, the Iran-backed militia had said its fighters carried out a suicide drone attack targeting Israel's Iron Dome infrastructure. Israel said three people were lightly wounded. Clashes between Israel, Hezbollah and Hamas militias in Lebanon have been ongoing since October 7. Since then, more than 300 people have been killed on the Lebanese side of the border, mostly Hezbollah fighters, while nearly 20 people have died on the Israeli side, including soldiers and civilians. Tuesday's exchanges came amid heightened regional tensions following Iran's unprecedented drone and missile attack on Israel. And on Israel-Iran tensions now, Lord Cameron has urged Israel to do as little as possible to escalate tensions in the Middle East, ahead of talks with PM Benjamin Netanyahu. Israel has vowed to retaliate after Iran's unprecedented missile and drone attack over the weekend. For more on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent Aruni Adhikari from Nottingham in the UK. Aruni? Yes, Anuradhi. The UK Foreign Secretary will push Israel to rein in the scale of its response or fears it could lead to a wider war. He called on Israel's government to be smart as well as tough. Speaking shortly after arrival in Jerusalem, Lord Cameron said he was there to show solidarity after that appalling attack by Iran. He continued saying it's right to have made waves clear about what should happen next, but it's clear the Israelis are making a decision to act. Later, Lord Cameron will travel to a gathering of G7 ministers in Italy, where he will push for coordinated sanctions on Iran. He has accused Iran of being behind so much of the malign activity in the Middle East and called for other countries to adopt measures designed to restrict Iran's influence. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Aruni Adhikari from Nottingham in the UK. Thanks again. And now to the latest in the hush money trial of former U.S. President Donald Trump. The political witch hunt continues as the second day of the criminal trial concluded with seven jurors being selected. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg filed a motion to hold former President Trump in contempt of court, claiming that he violated the gag order imposed upon him. After hours of questioning and questionnaires on Tuesday, day two of former U.S. President Donald Trump's hush money trial in Manhattan ended with a selection of seven jurors. The panel selected so far consists of an IT worker, an English teacher, a nurse, a sales professional, a software engineer, and two lawyers. The jury selection will resume on Thursday with 11 more people needed to be chosen before the opening statements can begin. Trump is facing charges of falsifying business records to cover up a 130,000 U.S. dollar payment made to adult film star Stormy Daniels to buy her silence about an alleged 2006 sexual encounter Daniels said they had, which Trump has pleaded not guilty. But on the first day of the historic trial, the judge had to dismiss more than half of the 96 prospective jurors brought in because they said they did not think they could be fair and impartial. Outside the courthouse, Trump supporters and anti-Trump protesters filled the streets. And on the road to the White House tonight, U.S. President Joe Biden kicked off his multi-city tour of the battleground state of Pennsylvania with a stop in his hometown of Scranton. He won Pennsylvania in 2020 by less than 1.5 percent or roughly 80,000 votes. Folks, he's coming for your money, your health care and your Social Security. And we're not going to let it happen. We're not going to, can't let it happen. A fiery Joe Biden kicked off his multi-city tour of the battleground state of Pennsylvania Tuesday with a stop in his hometown of Scranton, renewing his calls to raise taxes for wealthy Americans and large corporations, while also taking shots at his Republican rival Donald Trump. Scranton values or Mar-a-Lago values, these are the competing visions for our economy. 
and they raise questions of fundamental fairness to the heart of this campaign. The latest poll found that voters trust Trump more than Biden to better manage the economy by a margin of 39 percent to 33 percent. Yet Biden is betting his economic populist message will animate voters in a blue collar region of Pennsylvania. No billionaire should pay a lower tax rate than a teacher, a nurse, a sanitation worker. I mean it. And Biden is contrasting his vision of higher taxes on Americans making more than $400,000 annually with Trump's promise to protect his 2017 slashing of the corporate tax rate. Folks, trickle-down economics failed the middle class. It failed America. And the truth is Donald Trump embodies that failure. With 19 electoral votes, Pennsylvania is a top prize in the 2024 presidential election that features a rematch between Biden and Trump. Let's go for a short commercial break now. More world news right after this. Welcome back. Now, how would you react if you were to witness a police chase unfolding in front of you? Well, most of us would probably only spectate, unable to make any calls on the matter. Well, this one individual is not like the rest, in what could count as one of the coolest encounters ever. A man helps stop a suspect from running away and after all the excitement, casually strolls back to his seat to enjoy his tea. This was the scene in Turkey. A security camera caught the moment the man got up from his chair and blocked the suspect. Once police were in control of the situation, he heads back to his drink, looking on as if it were a peaceful day in the park. Friends of the man were the ones who shared the video widely. He didn't think it was that big of a deal, telling reporters, I felt the need to intervene here. I thought I shouldn't let him pass through. And now we have another chill man in the middle of a crime scene. Well, forget Superman and all the rest. This is the hero we need in all our lives. Well, that's all the stories we've got to report to you on World News Tonight. Join us again next time for more key updates from across the globe. Till then, good night.